So uh, as Bruce finds the presentation, uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie Catlett uh, to you. Charlie was kind enough to uh, change his travel plans uh, to come down and, and spend today uh, with us. Uh, Charlie has a history. Uh, he has a long association with Illinois, having graduated from Illinois. I don't know how long ago, not too long ago, I don't think. Uh, but he also was the chief technology officer at NCSA uh, for quite some time, and we're very happy to welcome him back. He currently <coughs> has several titles. Uh, he's a chief uh, a research scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, he is with the University of uh, Chicago. And he is the founding director of the Urban Center uh, for uh, Computation and Data. Uh, and has started off that new center, which is the topic of his talk today. Uh, in between, he has helped start uh, many things, including the Terra Grid, including the Open Science Grid, and served as the chief information officer at Argonne National Laboratory. So I'd like to welcome Charlie up to the stage now and very much anticipate his discussion about things that maybe uh, uh, are not currently running on Blue Waters, but might someday soon. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to use this uh, so I can walk around. Um, and I'm going to set a timer for 45 minutes, which means um, I should be at least halfway done by then. And if, uh, if not, I'll, I'll rush through and we'll have time for questions. I'm going to uh, try to get, go into detail, but really I'm going to talk about three things this morning um, that I want you to walk away with. The first is, um, so I was at a UN meeting in Medellin, Colombia a couple of weeks ago, and at, at the, it was the UN Habitat World Urban Forum. And the report that came out of that meeting essentially said, I don't have the quote memorized, but essentially said the future of the planet from the standpoint of climate change and sustainability and resilience, um, solutions to th those challenges, the future of the planet, um, will be solved in cities. And now the reason they said that is because we've already passed the point where 50% of the globe lives in cities. And we're headed toward 80% by 2050. Now sometimes people say 70%, sometimes 80%. But in the next several decades, we're going to see a migration into cities that we've never seen before. And we're going to see growth in cities at rates already that we're seeing today that we've never seen before. The second point that I want to make is the point that I made to both the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory um, in order to get this center started two years ago. And that is, no matter what your field of science is, uh, whether it's chemistry or uh, physics or social sciences, uh, or even if you're not in science, if you're in design and architecture, there are really interesting and really relevant challenges and opportunities in urban sciences. And the third uh, point, which I, I think is probably the most important point that I'd make, is that when most people or many people think of cities, they think about the infrastructure of buildings and roads and, you know, uh, battery-powered cars and Roofs, roofs and parks and things like that. And I've been interacting for the last three years with the, the, um, the government of the city of Chicago, and I haven't yet found a challenge or an opportunity there that can be solved within a silo. So you might think of something like potholes or, or fixing a bridge or something like that as purely an engineering sort of issue, and to some degree that's true, um, but there aren't any pure engineering issues in cities that don't also involve economics and social sciences. So, so those three points, I think, is what, those are what I'd like uh, you to walk away from, uh, from this talk with. Now I want to give you sort of a tour of what we've been doing in urban sciences for the last uh, uh, couple years and where we're headed and um, uh, try to give you a flavor for both things that are already happening and then things that, um, that we plan. Uh, the first question many people ask me is, uh, because I'm primarily at Argonne National Laboratory, Department of Energy Laboratory, is why would the Department of Energy be interested in cities? Well, I already sort of answered that question with the first thing that I said. Department of Energy is interested in climate uh, change and resilience of cities to the impact of climate change, but also to the impact of uh, shrinking fuel supplies and things like that. 
So you can see from these two Landsat images, the one on the left from uh, 1980, the one on the right from 2005, this is the Pearl River Delta, so down uh, south part of China near Hong Kong. And you can see with your eyes the impact of urbanization as that area has gone from maybe 10 million people to something like 40 million people today. The, the government in China is going to put over the next four to five years something like $300 billion of infrastructure uh, into this area, roads and buildings and uh, utility networks and things like that. Um, and you can see the statistics at the bottom. I don't need to read them to you. But the point is that what happens in cities affects, you can see the visual effect on the planet. You, you probably already know that where cities are, the, the surface uh, temperature of, of the globe is higher there, the urban heat island effect. Um, but these kind of, um, this kind of change impacts the climate, it impacts fuel supply, impacts quality of life for people, which has other repercussions. And what we've been thinking about is, given the, the changes with rapid urbanization, as well as changes that will happen as the climate continues to change, we want to understand what are those changes, what are the impact of those changes on the natural environment that's the context within which a city sits, on the infrastructure that represents the physical part of the city, and as importantly, on the people and the social systems that make that city something more than some concrete, that make that city uh, a living thing. Now, I don't want to just pick on China. Here's the Great Lakes, as most of you know, because you're you know, 100 miles away or so. This is 20% of the world's fresh water supply. Um, if you look at our curation and our sort of care for the Great Lakes, it's kind of an embarrassing story. Here's just looking at power generation around the Great Lakes, and you can see where we're sending the, um, the, the, uh, the plumes of, of uh, coal-generated smoke right out over the city. Uh, here you, th you see uh, toxic algae uh, uh, plumes back in 2011. So even here in the Great Lakes, uh, we see the visual, visually we see the impact of urbanization and caring for, you know, feeding in this case, the, the needs of um, urban populations. So our center, the Urban Center for Computation and Data, we've, we've organized ourselves around these three themes of environment, infrastructure, and people. And then we've launched, cutting across those themes, we've launched three initiatives that are sort of technically driven, but they're really aligned with the timescales over which decisions and impacts of those decisions uh, unfold. The first of which is using computational models uh, to forecast what will be the implications, what will be the results of decisions like urban design decisions, like putting a highway in, like putting a 500-acre uh, uh, second downtown in Chicago. Um, this is particularly important because what we see in the, in the urban design and architecture business is that there's multiple generations of experience working on projects at, say, a single building, which is typical, or maybe 20 buildings and equivalent number of acres. And an urban designer can hold the information in their head for 20 buildings that says, what is going to be the impact on transportation? How is this going to impact the power grid? Uh, what's the growth of this site going to look like over the next five or 10 years? So those days of single buildings and 20 building campuses in terms of architecture and, and design aren't gone. Uh, but where the real action is, and especially in China and Southeast Asia and in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, with the growth is happening so quickly, as you could see in the slide with the statistics about China, that the typical project in China is now 500 acres or 1,000 acres. That's enough, uh, that's, you know, think of uh, these projects as an acre per building, right? So five, 600 buildings. Nobody can hold all the information in their head that says, how is this going to unfold over 20 or 30 years? And so we've partnered with architecture firms like Skidmore, Oings, and Merrill that do urban design to say, can we bring existing tools from computational science, stuff that's been running on blue waters and other things, you know, over other machines here for, for more than a decade. Can we bring those computational science tools to bear on urban sciences. And so it's a matter of coupling these two worlds that haven't typically uh, interacted. And the second area, and I'll probably spend most of the time in this second area, um, decisions and policies that take place and that have 
uh, impacts that unfold over weeks or days or months. And here's where we're doing a lot of work with the city of Chicago. And I, uh, I haven't come around as Ed has to appreciate the term big data. I still hate that term almost as much as I hate the term smart cities. Um, the, you know, the city of Chicago has been, uh, I would say, the world leader of cities in publishing data. And I'll just give you one example. And um, pardon me if there's a chip on my shoulder about uh, New York City. <laughs> I, I love New York City. Um, but Chicago publishes crime all the way back to 2011. It's a database of hundreds of thousands of records of every crime, geolocated, the type of crime, the police reports, et cetera, even updated as those things change. Other cities, like New York, say that they publish crime. What New York actually publishes is a PDF file every month summarizing seven types of crime. So Chicago has been a leader at pushing data out from the point of view of transparency, but also in a very clever move to be able to get other people to analyze their data so that they can run the city, they, the city hall, can run the city better. So we've been interacting with the city to try to uh, look for ways to use data analytics on their data for the purpose of making the city safer, making it more livable, making the city government more responsive to the taxpayers um, and the visitors and tourists who are also taxpayers that come into the city of Chicago. And with the goal of learning from Chicago in ways that we can apply in partnerships with other cities around the globe. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And you know, with respect to big data, Chicago, the biggest stream of data coming into the city of Chicago right now is, is the GPS tracking of all of their assets, vehicles. And that's about seven million uh, records uh, per, per year. So it's not really a whole lot of data by Blue Water standards. Um, it's, it's a trickle compared to what you see at a supercomputer center. So if you're you know, an astronomer or physicist, it's not big data to you but it's really interesting data. It has its own sorts of challenges because of the variety of the data and because you didn't have control over how that data was collected and how it's formatted as you do when you run your own uh, uh, codes. And then the third area I'll talk about is uh, much quicker timescales, and that is making decisions about traffic or about events uh, or about events that are planned or events that are unplanned. And for that, we've got a project just uh, ramping up right now, actually in partnership with a number of universities, inc including the University of Illinois. I'll talk about in terms of embedded sensing in cities and embedded information systems in cities. I'll mention a program that we started, um, as Ed was saying, you know, it's important for us to build into the next generation of scientists. And we have a program that just began last summer called Data Science for Social Good, and I'll mention uh, what's happening in that program as well. Okay, so let me start with uh, the first uh, uh, horizontal there, uh, computational science um, models to guide urban design. This is a project called the Chicago Lakeside Development Project. It's also called U.S. Steel Southworks, the actual site itself. It's a 589-acre it's a peninsula um, that sticks out into Lake Michigan about 10 miles south of the Chicago Loop, about three miles south of the University of Chicago. This is the plan on the left-hand side from Skidmore, Owings & Merrill and the developers, McCaffrey Interests, to turn that, what is right now a brown field, and I mean brown field just like it sounds, it's just a bunch of, there's infrastructure left over from when there was a steel plant there that uh, provided lots of, or probably the primary, uh, um, most much of the steel for uh, tanks and things for World War II. It was employing 30,000 people at one time. It closed in the late 1970s and it's been a brownfield ever since. So there's infrastructure there, but it's outdated. It's actually in the way of building something new. The plan you see on the left is for um, 602 buildings in the conceptual plan to be constructed over the next 30 years. And it's color-coded by zoning, retail, light industrial, uh, uh, residential, commercial, et cetera. And then in the font that you can't read, and I don't even think you could read if you blew it up uh, larger, each of those districts that you can see there has a target date or range of dates for when it will be built. Some of them say 2025 to 2030, others say 2035 to 2040. So the developers came to us as we were talking about applying computational science to uh, questions that would, would naturally answer themselves over 20 or 30 years, 
But by the time you find out the answer that you made the wrong decision, it's too late to change it or it's impractical to change it. So they had a very uh, simple question that they wanted to ask about this site. Based on the, uh, the zoning of the site and the dates that those districts are built or the growth of the site, so these two, uh, conceptually speaking, these two knobs right here. If I'm a designer, I want to modify those two knobs and then I want to ask the question, how does that impact the energy demand for this site over the course of several decades? I need to know that question, the answer to that question, because I need to work with ComEd uh, and do a contract for electricity and, get, and people's gas to do gas, or I need to, need to build my own facility, uh, or some combination of those two. And if I build my own facility, do I do renewable energy? It, are windmills going to be enough to power this site? And the developers, I was actually surprised that they were, they were actually quite um, unable to even get to the beginning of that answer. For example, they were using an Excel spreadsheet, which was scary enough to start with to forecast their energy demand. But the, the really scary part was that it had 50 columns for 50 years, and there was a number in the first column that was like 7 megawatts, and there was a number in the last column which was like 50 megawatts, and then they did a straight line projection from those two numbers. So it was surprising to me, the straight line projection was a you know, surprise as well, but it was also when I asked them, well, how did you come up with the numbers 7 and 50? Um, it was sort of a guess. So we have a number of different codes that take a single building with lots, you know, in one case, 6,000 possible parameters and do an energy demand calculation given weather information on a monthly basis. And what we did was we took those codes from Argonne and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and we made this uh, software framework for the developers that you see in the upper right. We took the CAD files from Skidmore, Owings and Merrill for those 602 buildings and we put them into something called City Engine from Esri. It's a GIS, it's a city design pro, uh, uh, piece of software. In this case here, the height is, and the color is energy intensity, so it's not the actual height of the buildings. But um, we let the designer select a building or a set of buildings and change the zoning or change the birth date or projected birth date of those, those buildings, and then we would run a multi-decadal uh, energy demand calculation for them. Immediately, uh, what you see is that you have to make lots of assumptions about the weather, and we had both statistical files based on history, and then we actually had 24 years of history files uh, of the weather. So these projections here, and actually I, this is dummy data here, we have real data, but this is an older slide, but these projections here were assuming that the next 24 years of, of weather looked just like the last 24 years of weather in the south part of Chicago. What we've been doing since doing this is we've taken those uh, historical weather files, taken out, so they're monthly files that say, you know, uh, uh, precipitation, uh, dry bulb temperature, things like that. We've taken them out month by month and, and allow the user, or in this case the designer, to rank them in various ways. So we, so we can now construct a synthetic set of, ye of years, or 24 years or more, of weather where we can say things like, well, let's pick the coldest January in the last 24 years, and let's say that's going to happen more than once every 24 years. It'll happen, let's say, every five years. Or let's take the, um, the highest precipita precipitation of April, and, let, and, and let's look at 50-year storms and say, what does it look like if the 50-year storms start happening every five to seven years? So now we've given the designer a set of tools that let them explore their energy demand as a function of not just the timing and, and growth of the site and the zoning of the site, which they have some control over, but some fairly large uncertainties as far as what will happen as the climate changes. Um, it's important to point out that none of our computational, none of your computational science models can predict the future. But what you can do is compare two different scenarios and do a, a qualitative comparison, and that's what architects and urban designers need to do. They don't need to know exactly uh, what the energy demand is, but they want to know, is this scenario going to produce a significantly better demand, however you want to measure that, than this one over here? So it's really about comparing scenarios. Now the next step on this project, and this is something that we've begun to work on 
uh, while asking NSF for funding through the Cyber Seas program is to start bringing in transportation to, to you know, fundamentally answer a couple of questions that we don't know. For example, um, if we have hourly uh, occupancy data, does that give us a better uh, or more accurate result in terms of the energy demand for the buildings? And what we'll do for that is we've got energy demand or energy usage data for buildings in the city of Chicago, and we can actually do the comparison between various computational models and the actual usage uh, looking into the into the past, obviously. Um, what we want to do, though, is give the transportation designer a similar set of tools that we have been talking about for the energy uh, aspect of the site. And so that is, um, if you if you were to look at a map of of Lakeside Chicago Lakeside development in the downtown Chicago, they're connected by Lakeshore Drive. Lakeshore Drive, as it ends at the University of Chicago, right by Jackson Park and the uh, Museum of uh, Science and Industry, has a capacity of about 57,000 vehicles per day. The Lakeshore Drive going through the site in Lakeside, uh, which is new, has a capacity of about 57,000 vehicles a day. There's 20 blocks in between those two areas where the capacity is significantly less than that, maybe like less than half. So at some point as this site grows, somebody needs to make investments in increasing the capacity between these two sites. And the way that that would be done without any sort of computational tools is just an argument about opinions. So what we want to do is use existing, again, existing models that we have for transportation in the Chicago area and try to get a handle on, based on growth and based on uh, zoning, what will the transportation demand be along Lakeshore Drive? And then what will, it, what will be different if we do various kinds of uh, infrastructure projects? How does it look if we put in bus rapid transit? How does it look if we use the, uh, the tracks that are there for a uh, light, uh, light rail service? So essentially, this, this is about giving tools to urban designers and planners uh, to be able to uh, anticipate their, oops, this is the old one. So I, I figured out early this morning that um, there's a really cool movie <laughs> that's supposed to be right there in that black part. Um, and you're not going to get to see it. But I'll tell you what it is. So one of the things we have to do for a transportation model is understand who's going to live at the site. Where are they going to shop? Where are they going to work? And there's a lot of data out there. The Census Bureau has data about where people live and where they work at a block level. It's anonymized, not individuals, but um, where people commute, uh, job types, uh, income levels, and things like that. And it's updated fairly frequently. The Chicago Metropolitan Air, uh, Agency for Planning did a survey of 10,000 households back in 2008. Um, for all 10,000 households, roughly four people per household, so roughly 40,000 people and they wrote down where they were throughout the day and what they were doing. So the video that di you didn't get to see is those dots moving around in the Chicago area and all the way over into Indiana and up into Wisconsin, um, color-coded by activity type. And what you see is what you might expect, which is uh, a rush into the Chicago in the morning, color-coded by work, and then that changes into the color uh, for entertainment, and then you see the dots going back out uh, in the afternoon. So from that data, we can do more than just visualize. We can actually get a, a handle for what the transportation demand might be like with given a synthetic population for the lakeside project. So I mentioned earlier, I'm going to now transition to the second topic, which is um, uh, analyzing data to understand cities. So I mentioned we've been working with the city of Chicago. On the left in the top, you see the city's data portal, which looks identical to 50 or 60 other portals that you'll find out there because they all use the same cloud service called Socrata. The city of Chicago started publishing data a few years ago, and I mentioned before that the clever thing about that is they got other people to analyze their data. So what you see in the lower left here are different ways that people have analyzed city of Chicago data. Um, and because so many cities are using this same technology, that means that these applications work with other cities as well, assuming that those cities are also publishing the same sorts of data. So, you know, I mentioned that we, the city tracks GPS vehicles. Uh, this is an animation or a snapshot from an animation showing the snow plows as they're moving through the city. Last summer we had students analyze the movement of garbage trucks 
to give the city a sense for whether their new routing scheme for picking up garbage was better than the old one from the point of view of miles driven and that means fuel and things like that. And one can similarly analyze the path of the 300 snow plows that are out there during a storm and ask the same question. Is this the right optimization for the way that we're clearing the streets? And the answer to that has a big impact on fuel and emissions and things like that. Other people have done mapping. This one here is zoning. This one here is an application that it's color-coded by the footprint of the building. Um, and the similar application here, you can get color-coded for the city. And by the way, you can click on an individual building and get all the information about it. Uh, uh, a similar map for building code violations and, uh, and other things like that. So what I'd say is version one, uh, you know, sort of open data of cities has generated lots of interesting mapping and visualization tools. But as I've interacted with the people that build these tools, one message that I've heard from them over and over again is, we know how to manipulate this data and visualize it, but we don't really know the right questions to ask about cities. Now, at the same time, I'm working with social scientists and economists and public policy people from the University of Chicago, and they're saying, well, we have lots of relevant questions about cities, and the honest ones will say, but we don't have any idea what data is available, and the really honest ones will add, and even if we did, we have no idea what to do with that data. So having these two sorts of conversations, I'm like, well, we should bring these two groups of people together. So we have an NSF uh, grant that uh, we've been using to bring those communities together to say, well, what could we do with this data from a scientific point of view um, beyond just mapping it to look at and maybe validate some of the social science theories or economic theories that, that people have and actually start to look at the data about them. On the right-hand side, you see a project that uh, just started in the last year. We helped the city write a proposal to the Bloomberg Foundation, uh, what was called the Mayor's Challenge. The Bloomberg Foundation got 300 proposals for projects that would move the needle in some way using technology in cities. We were not the first prize, but we were one of the four second prizes, so the first five, the top five out of 300, we thought was okay. New York City was not the first prize, by the way but I should continue on my uh, sniping at New York City. Um, uh, what we proposed is to take this prototype system here called Windy Grid. What you see here is just the heat map of the city. Uh, at a particular point in time, you can look at tweets, you can look at weather, you can look at um, density of, uh, of uh, city vehicles and other things. And this was built two years ago when the NATO summit was coming to Chicago. And Mayor Rahm Emanuel said, I want to know what's happening in the city at all places at all times. I want omniscience. Um, so we couldn't give them that, but what we could do, and I say we, it's actually the city of Chicago before we got involved, was to give them, give him a geospatial database where data was pulled in from lots of different sources within the city and public data sources. Some, despite the you know, publication of, data, there are some sources of data within the city um, that will not go out into the public space but that are useful for this kind of uh, situational awareness. For example, because everything's GPS tracked, you can, with this tool, you can actually say, show me a map of where all of the police cars are right now. How fast are they going and what direction are they going? Because every 20 seconds, those are updated. And then you can even say, show me where all the unmarked police cars are. So that level of inquiry, what's happening in the city right now, was what this was built to do. And what we said was, um, you know, if we use predictive analytics, uh, as the city already had been done for some uh, violent crime prediction, um, and then we use computational resources, we can start to ask much more interesting questions like, show me somewhere in the city where something unusual is happening. And to know that something's unusual is happening means that we have these machine learning algorithms that are being retrained every time there's an event, so continuously running in the background to give you a baseline for the city. As an example, simple example, where I live in Naperville, if there's a 911 call from my neighborhood, it's an event. It's an unusual event. Other neighborhoods in Chicago, if there's five 911 calls on a weekend, it might be a light weekend. So the number of 911 calls and what's normal in one place is not normal at all in another place. And so uh, one has to then uh, look at the city um, and, and then sort of adjust for that. 
Now, this is a, a list of priorities from the CIO's office. It's now about a year old, uh, this list, uh, and it's the previous CIO. The new CIO has come in and continued many of these projects. But I wanted to show it to you just to give you an, a, a sort of flavor for the kind of things that cities like Chicago and New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Tokyo, London, et cetera, that cities are interested in finding out from their data but that cities don't have tools to find these things out. And in some cases, even if you bring the computer scientists into the room, they might have tools, but they're not asking the question uh, that, uh, that these things are asking. So it's back to that. Uh, there are some people that have tools and the ability to look at data and do computational models and data analytics, and some people that have questions, and it's bringing those together. So I want to highlight this creating a neighborhood health index. This came out of a meeting with the mayor where, um, you know, in sort of keeping with his desire for omniscience, um, he said, well, I would like to know before a neighborhood goes sour, I'd like to know that it's headed in the wrong direction so that we could do something about it before it goes over the cliff. You know, in other words, we want the city of Chicago, this is the consistent uh, uh, message from the mayor's office and from the people that he's brought in, the city of Chicago wants to move from reactive policy to proactive policy. So they don't need to predict out 20 years for these kind of things, but they do need to look a week or two out and maybe a few months out or even a few years out. So creating neighborhood health index needs not the health of the bodies of the people that live in the neighborhood, but the economic health, the social health of the neighborhood. That's a question that um, isn't directly answerable with the data. You can't stick a sensor on a street pole and measure neighborhood organizational density or neighborhood cohesion or other measures that a social scientist would look at uh, for a neighborhood. In fact, you can't even tell what a neighborhood is and where its boundaries are from just looking at a map or looking at old data. The maps of the 77 community areas or neighborhoods in Chicago were drawn in 1920. And there's some usefulness of those boundaries today, but um, it's not really the way the city operates in those large uh, community areas. So I mentioned uh, the 911 being different in one place or another. Rob Sampson um, uh, was at Chicago, now at Harvard, has been one of the sort of pioneers in looking at cities and saying, you know, one thing that all cities have in common, uh, even though all cities are different, is they all are made up of neighborhoods. No matter how big the city is or how small the city, the fundamental unit of civilization seems to be, even if you go back thousands of years, seems to be the neighborhood. So Rob's work is really looking at neighborhoods and how do neighborhoods change over time. In fact, he wrote a book that just came out two years ago called The Great American City, Chicago and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect, um, which is about a 15-year study of neighborhoods in Chicago where Chicago was just chosen out of a number of candidate cities because it was studyable. Well, Rob in, in Harvard has been working on this sort of tool for being able to visualize data from the city of Boston. And what they've been doing is looking at how to adjust the data. Again, it's not big data, but it's interesting data and challenging data. So how do you adjust the data uh, according to the peculiarities of neighborhoods? And a very straightforward example is 311, which is a non-emergency 911 call. So you dial 311 uh, if a llama escapes from the zoo. You dial 911 if a murderer escapes from the prison, right? If, if there's a pothole, a light, a uh, street light out, a garbage can knocked over, rats, there are 250 different kinds of 311 calls. It's a non-emergency service request. So potholes is one that's very popular right now. Um, what they've done in Boston is to try to look at the frequency bias of 311 because some people in some neighborhoods have a different relationship with the city where they figure, I'm not going to call the city about this pothole because I know that the city doesn't care about me or my neighborhood. I can see that every day. Where other people um, would, would be sort of, a, one friend of mine who's a doctor at the University of Chicago says she's a vigilante with 311. She calls it all the time. So if you just look at 311 data for potholes in Chicago, you would conclude that the streets in the wealthy areas are falling apart and the streets in the not so wealthy areas are just fine. And obviously that's not true, but that's what I mean by looking at this data and then adjusting for various kinds of bias, including frequency bias. 
So back to the neighborhood health index, or we started calling it the neighborhood vitality index. We've been working with the city of San Francisco here because they've got a similar project they originally were calling echo districts, where they wanted to get, understand these kind of measures right here, neighborhood identity, access and mobility, these, these sorts of things that, again, you can't put a sensor on a pole to figure those things out. But you can start to get a feel for it from data sets that they do have like this up here if you put people who understand these things from the social sciences together with people who can do the data analysis of these, uh, these sorts of data sets. Now we have a, a similar project last, last summer uh, with the Cook County Land Bank in the upper right here. Upper right you see um, vacant properties around the city of Chicago ranked and sort of rated by these various um, uh, indicators and impacts and things like that. So we had students, uh, the question from the Cook County Land Bank is, the land bank exists to buy vacant properties back to reverse the drag that they have on neighborhoods uh, some of which you see here, these negative impacts. So in Chicago, because of the housing, or in Cook County, which Chicago is within, there are 120,000 vacant properties. So where do you choose to put your limited amount of funds to have the greatest impact if you're buying vacant properties? And we had our students look at 311 data, look at crimes, look at real estate transactions, look at income and, um, uh, and commuting patterns and, and things like that to give the Cook County Land Bank a set of tools that would let them at least do a cursory evaluation of properties and neighborhoods and say, looks like we can have the best impact if we, have, if, we, if we invest here. We just started a project with the city of Memphis that's similarly looking at data, but their question is, uh, given the trajectory of growth in the city, where is the city going over the next 10 or 20 years? And based on that, where should we invest our infrastructure dollars so that we can encourage that growth and meet its future needs. So they're looking at various measures for both the city's investment and the costs to the city uh, on a block by block basis around, uh, around the city of Memphis. So I give you three examples here of, uh, in one case, a trial that just finished, in two cases, uh, trials that are about to start. Um, this is uh, city of Chicago working with a group at Carnegie Mellon University uh, and the, uh, the data set, that uh, the data portal, as well as some in inside information. And what they're doing is, um, so I'll talk about this one here, which a, a, a double blind trial just happened. So I don't know about Champaign-Urbana, but in Chicago there are people, it's called the rat patrol, that every day their job is to put rat traps and bait out based on where people have called and complained about rats. And you know, any city that has water also has rats. Um, that list was replaced about eight weeks ago, the list that said, here's the addresses that you need to go to based on people calling and reporting rats. So the city replaced that list with a different list, which looked at these types of 311 calls, a subset of the 250 or so types of calls, and used machine learning to try to figure out what you probably could intuit yourself from looking at this list, but they could look at a lot more data uh, and do it quicker. And now they replaced the list with one that was based on this saying, where do we predict we will see rats in the next seven days? They, as I said, did this double blind trial for eight weeks. The results were uh, promising, but they haven't been fully uh, analyzed. Similarly, uh, black market cigarettes. So this little stamp right here costs 75 cents. Um, so that means that if you bring cigarettes in like the ones on the top from say Indiana or Wisconsin, you can make more money bootlegging cigarettes. Um, and so the city wants to know where should we send our inspectors where they'll have the most likelihood of finding these bootleg cigarettes which represent um, less tax, tax dollars comes in, uh, which represent having to raise prices on, uh, on property tax and other things like that. Uh, and then here, food safety inspections, similarly look at different data that the city has, some of which is public and some of which is not. Um, and then try to say, where do we send our food safety inspectors so that their time is optimized to find and then correct safety issues? So not just about catching the bad guys with food uh, uh, safety issues, it's about keeping the population safe. New York City has done something similar here um, with fire safety inspections, where they're looking at things like the zoning of a building and the number of uh, postal addresses associated with that building, or even using LIDAR uh, data 
to say, Here, here's a six unit uh, building here, but there are 14 doorbells on the front. Maybe we should send fire inspectors there because that's probably where you're gonna see the, uh, the dangers for fire. So cities are beginning now to use some very rudimentary predictive analytics uh, techniques to begin to make policy that starts to be more, both more efficient and then is moving in the direction of being proactive rather than reactive. Um, I mentioned uh, at the bottom of my first uh, the table there, uh, outreach training and things like that. Um, we hired about, uh, well, last uh, March into the university and to my center, we hired Raid Ghani, this uh, gentleman right here, what Raid did before he worked for us is he was at Accenture and then he worked for the Obama for America campaign and he was the guy that did the machine learning algorithms and the social networking tools and analysis um, work uh, for the campaign. So I, you know, I met him in December after the campaign was over. He was looking for the next thing to do and he said, well, I'd really like to work with students. So I said, have I got a deal for you? And we brought him into the University of Chicago. Well. He started April 1st, he called me up three weeks before that and said, hey, I'm at a reception with Eric Schmidt and he wants to fund our summer program, how much should I ask him for? Well, this is a delightful phone call to receive um, if you're in the business of trying to bring money in. Um, and so, you know, we, we went back and forth and decided, well, we thought about a summer program, but what should it really look like? We decided to have a summer program that brought in um, 36 students, we actually ramped it up to 39 with some uh, NSF funding that I had. 39 students came to Chicago for 12 weeks. Each of them worked in teams of three or four with a mentor, a professional mentor, on data science projects. They did 12 projects plus some informal projects on top of that, where what they learned, and by the way, so these are graduate and undergraduate students about a third of them were social sciences and policy and economics, about a third were math and statistics, and about a third were computer science. About a third were women, two thirds were, were men. Uh, they were from 28 different universities around the globe. Um, and they worked uh, on projects like I just, I, you know, I told you earlier about the Cook County Land Bank. So this is their poster from each of the groups that did a poster at ACM KDD last August. This is the Cook County Land Bank poster. So they, what they learned was how to, how to sit down with a partner like Cook County Land Bank and understand their challenge or their business opportunity in light of the data that's available and then translate that into a computational science or data analytics project, execute the project and learn what tools are available and then give back to that partner something useful. And in all 12 cases, that actually happened. They gave the partner something very useful. Now, no, Probably, you know, there's probably not a Nobel Prize in economics coming out of these posters because the point was to train the students. Um, the, there's uh, something that we also noticed about this generation of students that is, I'd say, probably fair to say different than my generation um, is that there's a real hunger to apply their scientific capabilities to problems that actually matter more than just making money. And one of the indicators to that was that when we put out the call through social media and P uh, uh, program officers in NSF and others, just put the word out um, from scratch. Nobody knew about the program. It hadn't even started yet. In two weeks, we got 560 student applicants from whom we chose the, the, uh, the 36, and then we chose the three more from the top 50. Um, this summer, we've increased the program in, in size. The, the gating factor is um, uh, it's hard to find good data science mentors who are also willing to, if they don't already live in Chicago, come to Chicago for the summer um, and who have time to work with students. But it's a full-time job. It's not these guys on the side. They really, they're sort of data science mentors slash camp, camp counselors. So this year, we're ramping to, uh, to uh, 50 students. And when Eric, this is a group picture when Eric Schmidt visited um, last August and he concluded this, this was a tremendous program and he wanted to keep it going. So with funding from his uh, private foundation, this is not Google funding, this is him personally, uh, we'll keep the, uh, the program going and it's about ready to start off uh, this summer. Now, I wanna close with something that we're just about to do where I've talked a lot about what we've done so far. 
And what we have done so far, so I want to now talk about that third layer of uh, urban sensing and embedded systems. What we have done over the last couple of years is uh, we've done lots of, of work with students of various ages all the way down to, you know, in this case here, really, uh, you know, grade school uh, kids using new microprocessors like the Arduino, the um, uh, more recently Raspberry Pi and other things, cheap little microprocessors that students can program with sensors and, and other devices and buttons and things. And they can do, do something that I couldn't do when I learned how to, you know, when I learned how to code, it was in Fortran with card decks. And the best I could do was to get a line printer to give me like, I did a, a graph of the trajectory of a, of a projectile that was fired at a certain speed in a certain angle, right? And figured out how to make the line printer do that. That was, that, I mean, I had to be really interested in computing to get through that to learn how to uh, use computers. So these kind of devices allow kids to see the results of their work immediately and to interact in a way that, you know, most of us couldn't if you learned how to code even 15 or uh, 10 years ago. So what we found was that we did some workshops here. Um, what you see is a workshop we did in the summer of 2012 as you can see in the background, it's in downtown Chicago at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And we had these kids um, working on an air quality sensor, this right here, in four teams. One team designed in a two-day workshop this plexiglass enclosure that would protect the device from the elements. Uh, another team, this one right here, uh, was doing the software based on some existing software. But they are optimizing the software that would report sensor values like temperature, humidity, et cetera, um, back to a cloud service uh, over the internet. So this was our software team. Uh, there was another team, not really shown here, that was going to decide where these things would go in the city. I'll come back to that. And then this team right here, uh, high school, not this guy, but these are high school students who are doing the soldering to actually assemble these boards. And this is actually, this is my youngest right there. And somebody chided me afterwards and said, you made your son? solder for two straight days like it was some sweatshop thing. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. 15-year-old, really hot thing, melting metal all day. They loved it. So what we found fr from this, though, was the important thing that we found was from the placement group. So despite the fact that we had this chief technology officer of the city and the chief sustainability officer enthusiastically behind us building these and said, yes, place them in the city, we could not find a place in the city that had the three things you really need for urban sensing. One, an environment that's protected from the weather and curious hands or curious baseball bats. Two, power. And three, network access. So you could generally get, you know, one or two of those things, but not all three. So what we learned was that building these sorts of sensors, the gadgets, is the easy part. But the really hard part is finding and placing these things in a city. And because cities don't have this sort of infrastructure today, there are some assumptions that we're making about cities that might be wrong. We don't really know if there's anything, for example, that we can do from an urban design point of view that will have any impact at all on urban heat islands or on a city's Im impact on the regional climate. Do white roofs help or green roofs or parks? We don't really know. We can guess, but we don't really know. We sort of know how wind travels through urban canyons. Why? Because we have simulations that show how wind goes through mountains. We have other simulations to show how wind goes or, or air moves through the Blue Waters uh, machine room. But nobody has any measured data about air moving through uh, urban canyons. It doesn't, it's just not there. So maybe the computations are correct and maybe they're not. So we went to the city and said, can you work with us and others in the area to solve this hard problem once for many groups for many years? And we proposed a platform of secure enclosures with power and internet access throughout the city. They said, this is a great idea. We'll make it one of our strategic technology initiatives, uh, which uh, uh, came out uh, uh, here in September of last year. So we put together, what we found was we started with this urban heat islands uh, question. We had some uh, air quality um, things that we did with the School of the Art Institute with bi bicycle mounting, uh, bicycle mounted sensors and GPS. 
And when we started talking about placing sensors in cities, out of the woodwork came scientists from lots of places that said, gee, if I could put this sensor on even every 10 blocks or every street corner, I could do some research that I can't do without that today. So we put a consortium together in December and January of this, uh, this year. 13 universities organized in four science teams, and I'm like two minutes away, so you look like you're getting nervous, Bill. Um, uh, four science teams, uh, uh, one led by Matt, Mike Papka, who's at Argonne and Northern Illinois University in computer science. What would you do with embedded systems on every street corner? A second team, which is the physical science and biological sciences, uh, like I talked about with urban heat islands and things like that, um, led by Rob Jacob from Argonne. A third team laid by, uh, led by uh, Kate Cagney, a social scientist and a demographer from the University of Chicago is, um, how might we use embedded systems in a city for social science research, for, uh, for uh, educational games or for healthcare uh, uh, applications? And then the, uh, the fourth team led by Dan Work from UIUC and he's in uh, civil environmental engineering, engineering questions about the city, tra traffic flow, pedestrian flow, things like that. So we put this proposal together in January for an MRI. We put a team together um, with 13 universities, including this one here, um, and then investing partners here. Um, so there's been, uh, at this point, Argonne and UChicago have already invested something in the range of $600,000 in the project, just getting us to the point where we can propose something cogent to the city. Um, each of these four companies and the city of Chicago put cost-sharing letters in that totaled almost one and a half million dollars over two years. Um, the, city's, uh, the city's part in the project is this uh, wonderful letter from the uh, CIO for the city, the commissioner for, for uh, Department of Innovation and, and Technology. And in that letter, which, you know, usually you get a support letter for a proposal, you write it, and so it's obviously going to be a nice letter. This is a letter that she actually wrote and got approved in the mayor's office to say, we will mount, we, in this case, we said, we want to propose 500 of these units in the city. She said, we will mount 500 of these or so for free, for no cost to the project, and here's how we calculate our cost share, and we will power them at no cost to the project. So we're now starting to work with the, the uh, to put these on street poles, the, the poles are owned by Chicago Department of Transportation, we're now starting to work with them uh, to make, uh, to, to carry on in that, that commitment. And then the universities on the right, uh, scientists from each of these universities uh, organized in one, of, one or more of those four science teams. We proposed to NSF uh, 500, but with Moore's Law in the budget that we asked for, we probably could get more like 800. And this is not the plan, but our illustration of what you could do if you had these on every street corner um, in the, in the you know, red, blue, and green showing a different number. So on the left-hand side, what could you do with 800 sensors uh, in the city? What could be your coverage? The actual density, uh, both of the nodes and of particular sensors, you won't need precipitation on every street corner, but you might want Bluetooth so you can figure out uh, what sort of uh, pedestrian action is happening. The density of those sensors, the, uh, uh, the, the nodes and the sensors in them will be driven by those four science teams. Now, we won't know about the NSF proposal until probably July or August. And so we, I went to Argonne uh, director and I said, we don't want to wait till summer. Can you fund us to build 30 to 50 of these so we can get going right away? And the answer was yes. So we have next week, we'll be putting together the prototype of these nodes, which will have most of these sensors it won't have wind or precipitation. Those will only go on some of them because they're a lot more expensive. Most of these are sensors that cost $50, in some cases $5. This is the route. This is 27 sensors here. This is the route that we're talking about. And you know, this is like a 15 minute walk here, um, just to give you a sense for scale. That we're working with CDOT, uh, Department of Transportation to try to get this in place by the end of July, um, in part because we want to get a jump on this. If we get the NSF funding, we'll already be down the road. If we don't get the NSF funding, it will be because we didn't show a prototype, so we'll go back next year and show this as a prototype. There's also a conference called the Internet of Things World Forum happening in Chicago in October, so we're at the same time ramping up uh, volunteers that are interested in developing software uh, to develop code around these things. So all these sensor values will go out uh, to a cloud service, actually to more than one. Um, 
immediately, so well, four times a minute, all these values will go out in completely public fashion, so any scientist can grab that data, uh, repurpose it, uh, analyze it, uh, build an application, et cetera. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, the, uh, I mentioned before the notion of a secure enclosure. This is the, uh, some of the parts here, and you can see uh, we're putting them on these nine-inch poles, and that's what the box looks like there. We anticipate that putting these kind of things in neighborhoods will generate a response from people. Um, so we started working last fall with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, they did a course in, at the University of Chicago campus where they said, um, uh, we gave the students a design, set of design criteria for the cosmetic wrapping of these boxes. Number one, conspicuous. Number two, friendly and inviting. And number three, multiple ways to interact both electronically and physically. So uh, these are some of the prototypes that they came out with um, that will uh, be chosen uh, on an individual neighborhood basis by workshops that the School of the Art Institute is, uh, of Chicago is um, uh, organizing. And then I'll close uh, by inviting you, uh, if you're in Chicago at some point, to go to the corner of Michigan and Jackson, so roughly across the street from Grant Park, um, in the Chicago Architecture Foundation, in the lobby is this scale model of the of the most of the city. It's one inch equals 50 feet. All the buildings are 3D printed, and what we've done for this exhibit is hung projectors around the outside, so that anyone with interesting data that's geolocated about the city can light up the city according to that data, even on an individual building level, which took some. Uh, people that knew better than I how to work with projectors and things like that. And then uh, one wall over here, which I've blown up, is the wall for the project that I just told you about. And then here's the half-scale prototype that's actually running uh, as of last week in the, uh, in, in the exhibit. So uh, it's really something worth seeing, even if you, this exhibit will run for 18 months. But uh, if you're in downtown Chicago, it's a really nice uh, uh, place to start your trip. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been fun to come back to uh, NCSA, and I'll take uh, questions. With data coming from so many sources, what are your uh, data analytics challenges and computational challenges? Uh, so some of the challenges with data coming from all these sources, um, one challenge is knowing the provenance of the data. Um, it matters how frequently the data was collected and how it was collected, and usually that is stored in someone's head. With MacArthur funding, we did a project last year where we worked with the city to develop a data dictionary framework that they're now populating with metadata about the data sources that they're starting to use. And they have like 300, not 300 different data, uh, data sources, but 300 different sources of multiple sources of data throughout the city. So that's one challenge, is just knowing what can this data tell you? Because sometimes you think data can tell you something, it actually can't answer that question you thought you were going to ask. A bigger challenge is that a lot of the data is unclean and missing data. And this is one of the areas where we've found collaboration between uh, applied mathematics people at Argonne and social scientists to see can we use machine learning to reduce the frequency of the human in the loop that goes through and cleans the data. As an example, uh, the university has something called Chapin Hall that does analysis of social service data, very sensitive data, so it's you know back in a vault. Um, from social service agencies, federal, county, state, and local. Um, they put together a master child services database every year, sometimes twice a year, that pulls in data from 12 different sources, and the result of merging and deduplicating individually and then merging them together is a database of 23,000 children by name and what services they're getting. Um, and that process takes several months and has a lot of human in interaction. And so that's an area where we've tried to use machine learning to reduce the number of times that a human has to check these, uh, check these things. So, so just dealing with the data. And then, of course, I mentioned already 
the data is always biased in some way, and so you have to figure out what that bias is and, uh, um, and then compensate for it. A uh, question back there, but. You mean for that first example where I talked about synthetic? So we're just at the point of, of being able to mechanically do that sorting around of months and things, but we haven't gotten to the point of looking at what people or reports like yours are projecting about the climate. So we've worked on the tool that would allow us then to say, okay, according to you know, your report, then we should construct a synthetic uh, uh, decades that look like this. Yes. You mentioned the way Chicago publishes its uh, data on criminal activity. Is there any chance that could be of more use to criminals than to the rest of us? Uh, this is always uh, an issue when you publish data, uh, the please rob me sort of thing, right? Which is one of the reasons the police car data doesn't go out. Uh, early on in this process, there were some cases where too much data got out and then the city realized, and all cities have gone through this and then pulled the data back. For example, you don't, you know, 311, you'd think that uh, it wouldn't matter who called 311, but it turns out that that could be exposing somebody and obviously 911. So there's some, some significant thought to how criminals might use the data. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not sure there's much we can do to prevent criminals from doing clever things with data without uh, preventing ourselves from doing clever things with the data, but 